I know that after uh, leaving America, coming to Romania, some of the situations, circumstances around all of it had had actually, you know, hurt my witness. Like it had, it had affected me uh, in a way spiritually that I was not happy about, but I didn't seem to have a way to snap out of it. And I've been praying for, oh, good half a year now, at least or more. Uh, especially after going through all the cleansing and stuff, it, you know, my spirituality is not what I would like it to be. It's not as prevalent as I would like it to be. Of course, some of the the break has helped with that. But what I would say I have been discovering, and we're going to talk more about this this evening in our in our message or ideas around it. You see, it is the study of the three angels' message that actually does bring revival. And the first angel's message and a proper understanding of it was what brought those brethren to see that the judgment, well, they thought Jesus Christ was coming, but it still was the judgment hour message. They mistook the event, but the message itself was not invalid. It was valid. It was as God would want it, and it inspired them. And so all I can share with you is that there is something to what we're talking about here. There is a spiritual blessing around these things, and it has been bringing revival to me. The things that I thought in Reformation, the things that I thought would be quite boring, like, I don't want to read about William Miller's life. I heard enough about it. I went to Black Hills Mission College. We talked a little bit about William Miller there. I mean, I know, he is a farmer. He, you know, he studied the prophecies. He studied the Bible verse by verse, and he, you know, he had some meetings and you know, and it, it led to the Seventh-day Adventist church. Is that not enough to know? I've been going back in and I have been studying this man's life. I'm starting to learn about, you know, him and, and reading statements about him and just seeing the impact of what God can do with one man. One man who has a desire to share God's truth as being revealed to him with the proper method of Bible study, what that can do and reading about how God used him and it is amazing. It is inspiring stuff. And this is the kind of things we need. You know, we it is the experience of the first and second angel's message. It is the living experience that empowers the third angel's message. And we want to give the third angel's message, right? Because the Sabbath question is coming. And so we need to be able to give the three angels' message. We're going to talk about it today. We're going to talk about old light and new light. This is the thing. The, the objection that I've seen so far as I've shared some of these ideas is, okay, that was 170 years ago. That's what they talked about then. How is that relevant now? You know, we live in a modern society. Like, what, what does that have to do with now? I realize that I've had that question asked many times. I thought, I keep on telling people, you just need to go read Christ's Object Lessons, chapter 11, Things New and Old, and you'll have your answer about how old light and new light work, or how God's going to give new light. But that's what we're going to study today. That's what we're going to do. We're going to do that because uh, it's a kind of a first things first. Today we're going to talk about things new and old. And I'm going to pray now. Father, I come to you in the name of your Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. And I'm so grateful for the blessings of Sabbath and the blessings of fellowship. I'm grateful for the message that you've given us as a people. And I ask a blessing now to share with my brethren. There's been some prayer requests that have been raised today by Sister Avia, Sister Shauna. We want to lift those up for people's healing and for witnessing and sharing. There's, I know others on this call that are desiring to witness to their brethren, to witness to those that do not know the truth. I pray that the things that we share today would empower us to be better and come up higher and to serve you more effectively and fully. And so, Jesus, I just pray that you would speak through me now. Use me as your vessel. You promise we are two or more gathered in your name, that there you are in the midst. And we claim that promise now, believing you're with us, even though we are separated by space. We're all over the, the world here on this call. But we just ask that you would just reach out to each and every one of us, open up our minds to receive and understand these things and to be blessed. And I again thank you for your love and mercy, your great goodness to us. And boy, it won't be long now. We're, we're going to go home soon and just help us to be faithful to the end, to stand true and sure no matter what comes at us and to be prepared to make a certain sound when we're asked why we believe in the faith that we hope and have within us. We thank you for your mercy to us. We pray these things in the mighty name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, and in the glory of our Heavenly Father. Amen. So three months ago, 
I had a profound experience when I shared last week about how that I had uh, been wondering, you know, where I should go in my devotion. I felt strongly impressed that I should read what at that time I thought I'd never heard of the 1858 Great Controversy, but it's really actually Spiritual Gifts Volume 1 is what I read. I began reading through it and uh, chapter by chapter. And when I got to chapter, I believe it's chapter 23 there, it's on the first angel's message. I read this sentence and I read it last Sabbath. I'll read it again. I saw that God was in the proclamation of the time in 1843. It was his design to arouse the people and bring them to a testing point where they should decide. What really hit me there is the I saw because I have come to understand spirit of prophecy from a certain perspective. I don't know if everyone sees it that way or will watch this video, will see it that way. But I've come to understand that when a statement like that is made, it's made with absolute authority. That means that that is just as take it to the bank, so to speak, or true and solid as the very written word of God in our Bibles. This is how it is. And based on the principle of Malachi chapter 3, verse 6, that I am the Lord God, I change not, therefore you sons of Jacob are not consumed, then this idea still holds weight today. And what that did is she goes on to say, ministers were convicted and convinced of the correctness of the positions taken on the prophetic periods, and they left their pride, their salaries, and their churches to go forth from place to place and proclaim the message. That's taken from One Spiritual Gifts, page 133. Uh, she also has statements about how that right here before Christ comes, people will be doing the same thing. They'll be laying down everything to go and declare the message that God has given. Now, what is that message? We need to understand it. So everybody talks about new light. There is some light emerging on certain subject matter right now, and I'm grateful for that light. I know the impact that it's had on me. Uh, some of you are aware of what I'm talking about. Uh, some of you may not be. That's okay. I'm sure in time, God will reveal all things because one of the rules of uh, Miller's rules is that all scripture, all scripture can be understood and is profitable. And of course, that's actually uh, in 2 Timothy as well. It furnishes the man of God and uh, it's, it's profitable for reproof, correction, and doctrine, all of the Bible. And none of the Bible can technically be ignored. And there is light for every generation. There is a understanding. But how are we going to get there? is the question, is it a first things first kind of thing? And I do believe that is the case. Now, uh, I thought that I understood some things, but I'm realizing that, as the Bible says, if any man knows anything, he knows nothing as yet as he ought to know. And so uh, this has been a very humbling experience for me, beginning to study these things, but also very uplifting. And I'm reading similar ideas as well about that is actually how this is supposed to work. Um, because we are to cry out to God between the porch and the altar. We are to go to him with tears. Uh, in Ezekiel, it talks about those that sigh and cry for the abominations that are done in the land. And those abominations that are done in the land are not only, uh, you know, uh, the sins of the, um, the world itself, but, but even our lack, our lack of understanding, our shortcomings, our failures, we're to be we're to be crying to the Lord because we know that there's something missing. Um, so let's, what we're going to do, and I don't know uh, if you all have it handy. If you don't, that's okay. But it, we're going to be in Christ's Object Lessons, and we're going to be in Chapter 11, and we're going to read through. Um, we're not going to read all the chapter. We're going to read a pretty good portion of it, and we're going to make some comments along the way, some interjections on this, and share some Bible text as well. And, uh, and just pray this will be profitable. I pray this will be illuminating. I don't know if any of y'all have read this. Maybe you read it before. It was a long time ago. I've read this chapter numerous times now. And I read it again this morning. And it's like every time I read it, something comes out new. I get, I get, I get a blessing, a spiritual blessing. So um, Christ's Object Lessons, chapter 11, starting on page 134. Or excuse me, 124. Christ was teaching the people. He was educating his disciples for their future work. 
In all his instruction, there were lessons for them. After giving the parable of the net, he asked them, have you understood all these things? They said unto him, yea, Lord. Then another parable he set before them, their responsibility in regard to the truths they had received. Therefore, he said, every scribe, which is instructed in the kingdom of heaven, is likened to a man that is a householder, which bringeth forth out of his treasure things new and old. The treasure gained by the householder he does not hoard. He brings it forth to communicate to others, and by use the treasure increases. The householder has precious things both new and old. So Christ teaches that the truth committed to his disciples is to be communicated to the world. And as the knowledge of the truth is imparted, it will increase. So if you want more truth, share what little you have. This idea also comes out in the feeding of the 5,000 when Jesus says, give you them to eat. What little we have, Christ magnifies and multiplies. He makes an abundance out of it. All who receive the gospel message into the heart will long to proclaim it. The heaven-born love of Christ must find expression. Those who have put on Christ will relate their experience, tracing step by step the leadings of the Holy Spirit. Hungering and thirsting for the knowledge of God and of Jesus Christ, whom he has sent, the results of their searching of the scriptures, their prayers, their soul agony, and the words of Christ to them. Thy sins be forgiven thee. It is unnatural for any to keep these things secret, and those who are filled with the love of Christ will not do so. In proportion as the Lord has made them the depositories of sacred truth will be their desire that others shall receive the same blessing. And as they make known the rich treasures of God's grace, more and still more of the grace of Christ will be imparted to them. They will have the heart of the little child in its simplicity and unreserved obedience. Their souls will pant after holiness and more and more of the treasure of truth and grace will be revealed to them to be given to the world. So here we see a formula for how this works. We want more, we got to give. We give, we get more. The great storehouse of truth, now watch this, is the word of God. The written word, the book of nature, and the book of experience in God's dealing with human life. These three areas are the great storehouse of truth. They are the word of God. But we're going to see as we read through this that first and foremost, as God speaks and as his spirit works, is his written word, the Bible that we hold in our hands. But he also speaks through the book of nature, and he also speaks through our own human experience. I would refer to it as how providence works, and we have these experiences, and we look upon them. She says, we have nothing to fear for the future, except we forget how God has led us in, his, in, our, in the past and our teachings, our past teachings as well. That's something we should fear. That's why we're covering these things now. Here are the treasures from which Christ's workers are to draw. In the search after truth, they are to depend upon God, not upon human intelligence. The great men whose wisdom is foolishness with God. Through his own appointed channels, the Lord will impart a knowledge of himself to every seeker. Now, what are those imparted channels again that God will impart a knowledge of himself to the sincere seeker? The written word of God, the book of nature, and the our own human experience, how God leads us as Sister Britt Marie was sharing her son, walking into the thrift store and finding there in front of him, seeing right there as he walks in, a placard with the Bible verse that he wants for his own life. As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. That is a human experience that shows that God is speaking. If the Father of Christ will believe his word and practice it, there is no science in the natural world that he will not be able to grasp and appreciate. There is nothing but uh, there is nothing but that will furnish him with means or means for imparting the truth to others. Natural science is a treasure house of knowledge from which every student in the school of Christ may draw. As we contemplate the beauty of nature, as we study its lessons in the cultivation of the soil, in the growth of the trees, in all the wonders of earth and sea and sky, there will come to us a new perception of truth and the mysteries connected with God's dealing with men. The depths of his wisdom and judgment as seen in human life, these are found to be the storehouse or a storehouse rich in treasure. But 
It is in the written word that a knowledge of God is most clearly revealed to fallen man. This is the treasure house of the unsearchable riches of Christ. I want to read that again because this is the touchstone of us as a ministry. We, and you're going to see this more as we continue to read. We call ourselves in dwelling word. These ideas come out very clearly. This is why. But it is in the written word that a knowledge of God is most clearly revealed to fallen man. This is the treasure house of the unsearchable riches of Christ. The word of God includes the scriptures of the Old Testament as well as of the New. One is not complete without the other. Christ declared that the truths of the Old Testament are as valuable as those of the New. Christ was as much man's redeemer in the beginning of the world as he is today. Before he clothed his divinity with humanity and came to our world, the gospel message was given by Adam, Seth, Enoch, Methuselah, and Noah, Abraham and Cana, and Lot and Sodom bore the messages, and from generation to generation, faithful messengers proclaimed the coming one. The rights of the Jewish economy were instituted by Christ himself. He was the foundation of their system of sacrificial offerings, the great antitype of all their religious service. The blood shed as the sacrifices were offered pointed to the sacrifice of the Lamb of God. All the typical offerings were fulfilled in him. Now I want to pause here just for a moment and I want to talk a little bit about this particular little section here. I want to go to Malachi chapter 2. Take you there, please. If we go to Malachi chapter 2, I want to share a thought with you that came to me as it talks about the rights of the Jewish economy. In Malachi chapter 2, and as it relates to the father-son movement, it says here in verse 1, And now, O ye priests, this commandment is for you. If ye will not hear, and if ye will not lay it to heart, to give glory unto my name, saith the Lord of hosts. I will even send a curse upon you, and I will curse your blessings. Yea, I have cursed them already, because you do not lay it to heart. Behold, I will corrupt your seed and spread dung upon your faces, even the dung of your solemn feast, and one shall take you away with it. And ye shall know that I have sent this commandment unto you, that my covenant might be with Levi, saith the Lord of hosts. Now, who is Levi? Levi, the Levitical priesthood, right? Now, look what God says he did here for Levi. In verse 5, it says, My covenant was with him of life and peace, and I gave them to him for the fear wherewith he feared me and was afraid before my name. The law of truth was in his mouth, and iniquity was not found in his lips. He walked with me in peace and equity and did turn many away from iniquity. This is what Levi did. And of course, Levi's then, his posterity, his descendants, would make up the priesthood of God's people, the tribe of Levi. In verse seven, it says, for the priest's lips should keep knowledge and they should seek the law at his mouth for he is the messenger of the Lord of hosts. But ye are departed out of the way. Ye have caused many to stumble at the law. Ye have corrupted the covenant of Levi, saith the Lord of hosts. Now, when we think about the priesthood, we just read here in this paragraph of Christ's Object Lessons on Things New and Old, chapter 11, how that the gospel was preached starting in Adam and going down to Abraham, even to Lot and Sodom, and then this rights of the Jewish economy, which were instituted for God's people. And at that point, then, we're now dealing with the Levitical priesthood, the last sentences we just read. And what was Levi to do? What was his responsibility or his descendants? Well, in essence to teach the father-son message because that is what the service typified, that God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever should believe on him should not perish but have everlasting life. This is the gospel. There would be an atonement made for the failure of Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden. The son of God would come and give his life, shed his blood, and that was the shedding of blood. That was the, 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 the skin's that Adam and Eve put on was the first typification of sacrifice that showed that blood would be shed to make atonement for them and they would have to wear Christ if Edom would be restored to them and this is the message that they were to teach. Adam taught it and it was passed down. Today, 
as far as Adventism is concerned, we understand that Adventism is basically in a rebellion. And I will talk more about this, but it's not just the father-son message that Adventism is in rebellion. There's much more to do. The rebellion of Adventism began before a rejection of the father-son message by the corporate church. It, something preceded even the Trinity, and it centers around the things we're talking about right now that I believe then open the door for everything else, and I think we can prove it, and we need to understand it. But the reality of it is, is that the tribe of Levi, if you think about it, within Adventists today, who would be antitypical Levites of the Adventist world today? I believe it can only be the father-son believers. We would be the typical Levite today because we understand what's necessary to teach the sanctuary doctrine. Now, you know, the beginning of Adventism, there was a mixture of Trinitarians and Father-Son. There was both. And God did correct those errors under the giving of the third angel. Uh, you'll see that actually if you just read carefully in spiritual gifts, you'll see that the, the errors uh, that uh, they were corrected there. Uh, the father-son message is not necessarily the first angel's message, although you can find it there. The first angel's message is the judgment hour message or the preaching of definite time. But we're just talking about how to discern light right now. We'll delve more into that maybe next Sabbath. I'm trying to, as the Lord leads. But the point I'm trying to make here is this. Father-son believers are the Levite. But the Levite was to do more than just teach the father-son message. I mean, the Levite had other things to do, and it opens the door, understanding the father-son message, to be a servant of the Most High, but we need to be profitable servants of the Most High. And what we just read here in Malachi chapter 2 is that the Levite had become perverted in their understanding and sharing of truth, or they were not giving all the truth. They were not giving all the message. And when you think about our first 50 years or the identity of the Philadelphian church age, there is a much broader realm of truth that we are to bring as Adventists than just the father-son message. Let's keep reading. Christ as manifested to the patriarchs, as symbolized in the sacrificial service, as portrayed in the law, and as revealed by the prophets, is the riches of the Old Testament. Christ, his life, Christ in his life, his death, and his resurrection, Christ as he is manifested by the Holy Spirit, is the treasure of the New Testament. Our Savior, the outshining of the Father's glory, is both the old and the new. Of Christ's life and death and intercession, which prophets had foretold, the apostles were to go forth as witnesses. Christ in his humiliation, in his purity and holiness, in his matchless love was to be their theme. And in order to preach the gospel in its fullness, they must present the Savior, not only as revealed in his life and teachings, but as foretold by the prophecies of the Old Testament and as is symbolized by the sacrificial service. We are to do the same. Christ, in his teaching, presented old truths of which he himself was the originator, truths which he had spoken through the patriarchs and prophets, but he now shed upon them a new light. How different appeared their meaning. A flood of light and spirituality was brought in by his explanation, and he promised that the Holy Spirit should enlighten the disciples that the word of God should ever be unfolding to them, they would be able to present its truths in new beauty. Ever since the first promise of redemption was spoken in Eden, the life, the character, the mediatorial work of Christ have been the study of human minds. Yet every mind through whom the Holy Spirit has worked has presented these themes in a light that is fresh and new. The truths of redemption are capable of constant development and inspection and expansion, and that is all truth, brother. Not just redemptive truth, but all truth. Though old, they are ever new, constantly revealing to the seeker for truth a greater glory and a mightier power. In every age, there is a new development of truth, a message of God to the people of that generation. The old truths are all essential. New truth is not independent of the old, but an unfolding of it. 
it is only as old truths are understood that we can comprehend the new. And that's why we're doing what we're doing, brethren. We have to have a return. Um, I would say it would be wise for me soon to rewrite certain sermons that I did years ago while I was at PHM on Philadelphia and Laodicea. But at that time, I did three of those messages. Some of you were in South Carolina when I did the first one talking about that Laodicea will have to return to Philadelphia if it's going to receive the experience that God would have for them to make it through to the end. There is this idea within corporate Adventism, which is an erroneous idea, that the Laodicean church age, you can be in a Laodicean condition, in other words, and that God is going to save you. God does not save those that are in the Laodicean condition. He loves them, and that's why he declares their condition to them, and he admonishes them to escape that condition by doing three things. One is the gold that is tried in the fire, which is faith that works by love, the white raiment, which is the righteousness of Christ, and the eye salve, which is spiritual discernment. But where are they going to get the spiritual discernment? They're going to have to go back to the old, because that's what we've seen has happened within the corporate Adventist church. And all of us have, in one way or another, been associated or come out of it. And we picked up a lot of things there. They forsook the old. They came up with the, what they thought was new, which was not new, was error. And many of us have adopted it. And we're going to have to go back to the old experience to seek out the old paths to receive the spiritual light and discernment, the oil that we need in our lamps, trimmed, and burning bright to go all the way into the wedding feast. When Christ desired to open to his disciples the truth of his resurrection, he began at Moses and all the prophets and expounded unto them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. But it is the light which shines in the fresh unfolding of truth that glorifies the old. He who rejects or neglects the new does not really possess the old. For him, it loses its vital power and becomes but a lifeless form. You see, these old things about our message and people thinking they're old, antiquated, don't matter, really shows that they don't really have a vital power working in them. Or they would be seeing the beauty of these things. You cannot possess the new unless you love the old. It says here, there are those who profess to believe and to teach the truths of the Old Testament while they reject the new. But in refusing to receive the teachings of Christ, they show that they do not believe that which patriarchs and prophets have spoken. Had ye believed Moses, Christ said, you would have believed me, for he wrote of me. Hence, there is no real power in their teaching of even the Old Testament. Many who claim to believe and to teach the gospel are in a similar error. They set aside the Old Testament scriptures of which Christ declared, these are they which testify of me. In rejecting the old, they are virtually reject the new, for both are parts of an inseparable whole. And many of us have accused the Sunday churches of doing these things or understand the Sunday churches have done these things, and they have. They have done these things. They have rejected the Old Testament. I I, you know, I came uh, out of the independent Baptist uh, denomination when I became an Adventist. That was where I'd been attending in church. And, you know, that we had certain people say, I'm a New Testament Christian. That Old Testament, yeah, that's, that's, that was for them Jews. And I, <laughs> I understand that sentiment all too well because I heard a lot of it. And, but I've heard that same sentiment even among certain leaders within the Father-Son message. I want to read some uh, statements to you. Uh, I'm not going to name any names, but uh, there are some prominent men teaching among our ranks that are teaching some of these ideas around the law of God. And I, I just I want to share a few quotes. I want to take a little bit of a, a, a detour here. Um, and I, I believe you're going to be a, kind of astounded uh, to uh, understand why, if they really understood the truth, why they could even make such statements some of them have made. I've heard them make. I heard one of them make one time that, that that law was for those pesky Jews. But, you know, now that Christ has come and given himself and he's resurrected from the, from the dead and he now lives as, as our high priest and he lives in us, we don't need that. 
That's in us. He's in us doing that in us. I'll read some statements to you. They're taken from Signs of the Times, October 2nd, 1883. Signs of the Times, October 2nd, 1883. There's a few statements here I'd like to read and uh, really covers this subject matter very well. Why is it that the people in this age are so easily drawn away from the observance of God's commandments? Now, we need to know what God's commandments are, and we'll talk about that in a moment. It's not just the Ten Commandments. There's more to it than just that. Why is it they relish the mockery of those who profess to be teachers of righteousness, who yet cast contempt upon the commandments of Jehovah? Is it not because the heart of this people is carnal? It's a surefire sign that if someone doesn't love the law of God, and not just the Ten Commandments, but also the Old Testament per se, those statutes and judgments that are contained there, if they don't love them, it's because they're carnal. That's paragraph three, or excuse me, paragraph two of Signs of the Times, October 2nd, 1883. Read you another quote. Those who advocate this doctrine say they rejoice in the glorious liberty wherewith Christ has made them free. But from what have they been made free? Not from sin, surely, since sin is the transgression of the law, and where there is no law, there is no transgression. Have you heard that sin is more than transgression of the law? It's a big debate within the father-son movement. I'm not going to get into that subject matter this evening. It's a, that's, a, that's, a, that's a weighty topic and requires one to wrestle with. But she goes on to say why we need the law. If there is no law, then there is, then is it right for every man to follow the depraved impulses of his own heart? For there is no standard by which evil can be detected. You see, we know what is evil by the law. The law detects evil. Therefore, <laughs> since the law calls out evil, when you transgress, then you transgress the law of God when you sin. So sin is transgressed to the law of God. It's very simple. That's taken from paragraph four of the same Signs of the Times, October 2nd, 1893. All of these are taken from this. this. It's just different paragraphs. I just want to read through. There's a few statements here. There's not very long, but very profound in their import. Jesus in the New Testament does the same work as Jesus in the Old Testament did. But men are so determined to do away with the law of God in order that they may find a way of avoiding the observance of the Sabbath. Now, of course, you know, this is centering around the Sabbath, but anything else for that matter, that they array Jesus in the New Testament against Jesus in the Old Testament. These blind leaders of the blind, who are ignorant of both of the scriptures and of the power of God, pour contempt on the law of God, and at the same time seek to sold up seek to hold up Christ in contrast to the law. But this they cannot do, for Christ gave the law to his chosen people. And in seeking to make void the law of God on the ground that Christ abolished it, they do insult to both the Father and the Son. Jesus says, I and my Father are one. So that's paragraph eight. Can you in any way minimize the law of God and truly preach the Father-Son message? Can't do it. They don't go together. The law and the father-son message go together. This is taken from paragraph nine. The blind teachers of this age who seek to turn the people away from the law of God tell the people that the law is Jewish, given only to the Jews and spoken only for their observance. Where is their authority for such a statement? The prophet says to the law and to the testimony, if they speak not according to this word, it is because there is no light in them and believe me, I heard a very prominent leader one time. I was at camp meetings in Roan Mountain, North Carolina, and I heard this prominent leader say that that law was for those pesky Jews. I heard him say it. Couldn't believe it, but he said it. And there's people that listen to that, and they believe it. Last paragraph I'm going to read from this is paragraph 11. My brethren, be not satisfied with the super knowledge of the truth, superficial knowledge of the truth with a surface view of the law of God. Dig deep in the scriptures of truth and with an understanding enlightened by the Holy Spirit, dwell upon the holy requirements of the law of Jehovah until you can reveal to the people their spiritual and eternal character. Your researches have not been deep enough. You need the inspiration of the Holy Spirit to aid you to search into the truth with reverence and awe, bringing your mind to the task with intense desire that will not be quenched until you see wondrous things out of the law. Dig deep into the mind of truth and be not satisfied until you have a more perfect comprehension as to what constitutes the strength of the law of God 
You need to search and search and weep and fast and pray in order that you may have revealed unto you such a view of the law of God that you will be fitted to go forth and watch for souls as they that was given account. Have you heard anybody talking like that in our movement? They should be. Now, why did I, why did I uh, just share that with you? Watch this. We're going to go back to Christ's object lessons. We just read here, before I reread these quotes, in rejecting the old, they virtually reject the new. For both are parts of an inseparable whole. No man can rightly present the law of God without the gospel or the gospel without the law. The law is the gospel embodied and the gospel is the law unfolded. The law is the root. The gospel is the fragrant blossom and fruit which it bears. Now, for us today, what is the law? Now, this was kind of came as a revelation to me. Maybe, I don't know. Some of you have heard this. I don't know. But, and you should read quotes and statements that she's made around the book of Deuteronomy. And I've done some studies on this in the past. I don't know if I have any of them published, per se. We did them in our group some. But in Malachi chapter 4, in Malachi chapter 4, we're told in verse 4, Remember ye the law of Moses, my servant, which I commanded unto him in Horeb, for all Israel with the statutes and judgments. Where do you find that? You find that in the book of Deuteronomy. You find it distilled in the book of Deuteronomy because that book was given right before they passed over into the promised land. God gave it to Moses to give to them and it was to govern them once they crossed over into the promised land. And the kings were to read out of it because God knew one day they'd seek a king. In verse five it says, Behold, I will send you, Elijah the prophet, before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord. And he shall turn the heart of the fathers to the children and the heart of the children to the fathers, lest I come smite the earth with a curse. And if truly the first and second angel's message was to lead them to the sanctuary, then the third angel's message opened to God's people that the law was still binding, the Ten Commandments with the Sabbath commandment, but we're also told in the word of God that those that will give the Elijah message, which are Seventh-day Adventist brethren, true Seventh-day Adventists, are going to remember the law of Moses, which was given in Horeb, with also the statutes and judgments. So now you tell me, can you really be a Levite, a minister of the father-son message, if you in any way minimize God's law and statutes and judgments for that matter? can't do it. It's an impossibility. It's an utter impossibility. But yet, a large majority of those who profess to believe this truth follow those kinds of ideas. It's a terrible thing. It's a little bit of an aside, not very long. I've never really preached a message directly on it. Maybe I should, but nonetheless, I felt like it should be covered because it comes out right here. Now watch this. We're not going to read this whole chapter now. We're going to skip. We're going to skip a segment. I recommend that you actually read the whole chapter for yourself. We're going to skip a segment uh, and, uh, and then we'll start to wrap up here in a moment. But it says, The Old Testament sheds light upon the new and the new upon the old. Each is a revelation of the glory of God in Christ. Both present truths that will continually reveal new depths of meaning to the earnest seeker. <laughs> now, that's amazing because she says the same thing about the first, second, and third angel's message. She says the same thing about it. Our message, the message that God gave us as a people, which has been referred to as present truth, will do the exact same thing. You could put present truth right here in what I just read. I could say that present truth, she says present truths here, but present truth as understood in the first, second, and third angel's message will continually reveal new depths of meaning. But who is it given to? To the earnest seeker. Now, I have to admit that I've not been the earnest seeker I should be. And I'm ashamed to say that because I have been one who has been before the people as a Levite, so to speak, to teach the people. But by God's grace, no more. Uh, we, we, we go deep and uh, we dig deep into the minds of truth. Now, I'm going to skip down. We read all the way up there to page uh, 128, and now we're going to skip over to page 132, and we're going to start 
on the paragraph on page 132, it's about the third sentence down, third paragraph, where it says God's holy educating spirit. That's where we're going to start. And we're going to read a few more paragraphs and then we're going to finish with some closing ideas. It says here, God's holy educating spirit is where? In his word. Can't get any more plain than that. God's holy educating spirit is in his word. A light, a new and precious light shines forth from every page. Truth is there revealed and words and sentences are made bright and appropriate for the occasion as the voice of God speaking to the soul. i read it one more time. You need to let this one sink in. I've known this. <laughs> I've known this. It's all through Spirit of Prophecy, but she doesn't, I mean, I, I, I know I've read this in the past, um, but I read it this morning again and I was like, it's right there. That's, it's why we call ourselves in dwelling word. God's holy educating spirit is in his word. A light, a new and precious light shines forth from every page. Truth is there revealed and words and sentences are made bright and appropriate for the occasion as the voice of God speaking to the soul. The Holy Spirit loves to address the youth and to discover to them the treasures and beauties of God's word. The promises spoken by the great teacher will captivate the senses, and animate the soul with a spiritual power that is divine. There will grow in the fruitful mind a familiarity with divine things that will be as a barricade against temptation. Now, before we go any further, I do want to just say one thing. And we read it again. I want to just share it one more time. The old truths, going back to page 128, the old truths are all essential. New truth is not independent of the old, but an unfolding of it. It is as the old truths are understood that we can comprehend the new. And where are we going to get the old truth to comprehend the new? We're going to get it from the word of God. And it's going to be ever unfolding. So watch this. Back to page 132. The words of truth will grow in importance and assume a breadth and fullness of meaning of which we have never dreamed. The beauty and riches of the word have a transforming influence on the mind and character. The light of heavenly love will fall upon the hearts as inspiration, as an inspiration. The appreciation of the Bible grows with its study. Where whichever way the student may turn, he will find displayed the infinite wisdom and love of God. The significance of the Jewish economy is not yet fully comprehended. Truths vast and profound are shattered forth in its riches and symbols. The gospel is the key that unlocks its mysteries. Through a knowledge of the plan of redemption, its truths are open to the understanding. Far more than we do, it is our privilege to understand these wonderful things. We are to comprehend the deep things of God. Angels desire to look into the truths that are revealed to the people who with contrite hearts are searching the word of God and praying for greater lengths and breaths and depths and heights of the knowledge which he alone can give. As we near the close of this world's history, the prophecies relating to the last days especially demand our attention. The last book of the New Testament scriptures is full of truth that we need to understand. Satan has blinded the minds of many so that they have been glad of any excuse for not making the revelation their study, and I would also say is the book of Daniel. She doesn't say it here, but she also admonishes in spirit of prophecy. We are to study the prophecies of Daniel. But Christ, through his servant John, has here declared that we shall be in the last days, and he says, Blessed is he that readeth, and they that hear the words of this prophecy, and keep those things which are written therein. This is life eternal, Christ said, that they might know thee, the only true God and Jesus Christ whom thou hast sent. Interesting that she puts the father-son message right after the study of prophecy. Why is it that we do not realize the value of this knowledge? Why are not these glorious truths glowing in our hearts, trembling upon our lips and pervading our whole being? The prophecies of Daniel and the prophecies of Revelation. Why? Why is it? Well, I believe... The reason why is because we've not been receiving it. We've not been getting it. Leaders have not been sharing it. We ourselves have not been studying and wrestling with these things. We have, we have been 
tricked into thinking that that old antiquated stuff is not relevant now and that we need something new, but we can't have anything new unless we embrace the old. God's not going to add any new light and it will merely be an unfolding of the old anyway unless we're willing to go there and dig deep in the minds of truth with faith as searching for hidden treasure and then allow these things by the Spirit of Christ to be revealed to us. Last two paragraphs we're going to read. In giving us his word, God has put us in possession of every truth essential for our salvation. That's a powerful statement. Thousands, now watch this. Thousands have drawn water from these wells of life. So what are the wells of life? The word of God. Yet there is no diminishing of the supply. Now watch this. Thousands have set the Lord before them and by beholding have been changed into the same image. How is the Lord set before you? It's his word. This is the same thing she's referring to when she says, Thousands have drawn from the water. That's the word. Thousands have set the Lord before them. You want Christ before you? He's before you in the word. Their spirit burns within them as they speak of his character, telling what Christ is to them and what they are to Christ. But these searchers have not exhausted these grand and holy themes. Thousands more may engage in the work of searching out the mysteries of salvation as the life of Christ and the character of of his mission are dwelt upon, rays of light will shine forth more distinctly at every attempt to discover truth. Each fresh search will reveal something more deeply interesting than has yet been unfolded. The subject is inexhaustible. The study of the incarnation of Christ as atoning sacrifice and mediatorial work will employ the mind of the diligent student as long as time shall last. And looking to heaven with its unnumbered years, will he exclaim, Great is the mystery of godliness. And what did the first and second angel's message do, brethren? Well, we're going to study this more. We're going to see this. But it opened the way into the sanctuary where Christ is revealed. They had lost sight of Christ. If you understand the history of what was going on with the churches at that time and why God did raise up William Miller was to cause them to look and seek Christ. Of course, they thought he was coming soon. But it drove them to Jesus nonetheless. In eternity, we shall learn that which, had we received the enlightenment it was possible to obtain here, would have opened the understanding. The themes of redemption will employ the hearts and minds and tongues of the redeemed through the everlasting ages. They will understand the truths which Christ longed to open to his disciples, but which they did not have faith to grasp. Forever and forever, new views of the perfection and glory of Christ will appear. Through endless ages will the faithful householder bring forth from his treasure things new and old. And this is an amazing thought as we close on this particular chapter. Where will these things be unfolding throughout ceaseless ages? The very Bible we hold in our hands now, brethren. There is light that if we by faith could obtain it, here we would get, we may not get it here because we may not have the faith to get it, but we will be getting it in heaven. And the treasure holder, which is the word of God, the Old and New Testament will continue to unfold light for all eternity. That is an amazing thought. So therefore, then how can you tell me that an old, what's considered the old understanding or the, the true understanding of the first angel's message, even though it was 170 years ago, could ever be antiquated. How can you tell me that? You can't. <laughs> now, we live in the time of the end. We live in the last days. What is the message we're to give? We're to give the first, second, and third angel's message. And so we're going to continue to study these things. But as I said, I, I felt like I should do this message uh, in general for us, but as well as for others who might have never read that chapter or really understood, new light is merely old light. We want new light. We got to go back and study the old stuff. That's why it makes perfect sense when Ellen White would make a statement like, what we believed and teached for the first 50 years of our church will be taught 
all the way till the end. The sacred truths that we held then will be held all the way till Christ comes because old truth never becomes old. Um, it always unfolds and grows and becomes new for those who receive it. I mean, I think about when I, you know, I'm sure you can relate to when you finally understood the father-son message. That's old light. That goes all the way back to the Garden of Eden, the father-son message. But it was new light when you finally grasped it. And it was an amazing and wonderful thing. It was such a honeymoon I had when I first, started the, uh, first learned the father-son message. It was a blessing. But yet at the same time, uh, we don't just dwell on that one theme forever. Uh, we, have, we have other, as they would say, other fish to fry. I didn't share it, but I will share this real quick too. Let me just share this uh, one statement here. Also out of Christ's Object Lessons, chapter 11 that we just read. I'll share this and then we'll pray. Something to think about. It's in, uh, it's a paragraph on page uh, 130. I kind of skipped over this section. I probably will do a message just on the section I skipped because there's so much meat in it that, uh, but I, I wanted to stay just on this old and new theme, uh, this dealing more in redemption within this chapter. But it's uh, the paragraph that begins this experience. It says, this experience gives every teacher of truth the very qualifications that will make him a representative of Christ. The spirit of Christ's teaching will give a force and directness to his communications as to his prayers. His witness to Christ will not be a narrow, lifeless testimony. The minister will not preach over and over the same set discourses. His mind will be open to the constant illumination of the Holy Spirit. To keep going over and over and over the same ground as a minister, per se, is not necessarily a sign that you are being led by the Spirit of God. You might get really good at doing it and praise the Lord for that, but God's Spirit, His Word is constantly unfolding old truth becoming new light for those that he's moving upon. Anyway, I pray that uh, this message will be an inspiration. I'm going to close with prayer now. Father, again, I come to you in the name of your Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, and I thank you so much for the Word of God. I pray that we would really place the stamp of, of um, earnestness that inspired those that founded the Seventh-day Adventist Church to seek and search it as for treasure, that uh, you would give us the, the methodology, the understanding of the method that you gave, Miller's Rules of Prophetic Interpretation, you would enlighten our minds on how to read the Word of God literally, how to define figures, how to unfold these things, or how to have them unfolded for ourselves that we might then share and bless others and light increase for us as we impart, more is imparted to us. And that we wouldn't be guilty of minimizing in any way your law, uh, the statutes and judgments, the whole word of God, the Old and New Testament, and that we would embrace all of it as we can find in its literal pages. If there's light there, though, Men may reject it, though men may scoff. We would take all of it. We would, as Jesus said at the Last Supper, drink ye all of it, that we take it all in and we go forward and in the end be counted worthy for the kingdom of heaven. I thank you for your love and mercy to us and I pray these things in the mind of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, and the glory of our Heavenly Father. Amen.